All right. So it uh, looks like um, we're going live here. So I wanted to welcome everyone. Um, so uh, welcome to the latest edition of Let's Keep Moving with the APDA. Um, over the next three months, we'll be taking a look at balance in Parkinson's disease. There are many different types of balance problems that can develop in many ways that Parkinson's disease can affect your balance. Thinking more carefully about uh, what these are and how they may affect your daily activities can help to make sure that you're as safe, active, and as independent as possible. Our main goal today is to get you thinking more like a physical therapist when you think about balance by teaching you a little bit more about these different components of balance then you can better anticipate times uh, that you may become unsteady uh, and ways of helping the problem. So just as a quick introduction, I'm a physical therapist from the Boston University Center for Neurorehabilitation. We partner with the APDA for the Rehab Resource and Referral Center. In addition to this resource, um, you can also see uh, the Center for Neuro Rehab social media information here if you'd like to follow us. Now we should probably start off just by making sure that we're on the same page when we use the term balance. Let's all take a quick second to think about what comes to your mind when you think of the word. What sort of activities do you think of when you think of someone balancing? Some of you might be thinking of somebody standing on one leg. Um, others might be thinking about stepping down a curb or getting off of an escalator. Balance can mean standing still and balance can mean moving in a controlled purposeful way. All of these examples involve balance. So to help us what, understand what types of uh, problems people can have with balance and what can be done about them. Um, we should first be a little more specific about defining that term. In my field, we often use this, this term postural control rather than balance. And there are many different definitions that we use for postural control. We can try to keep it fairly simple today and just think of it as the body's ability to maintain its center of mass within its limits of stability uh, while maintaining a given position or performing a specific task. Now here are two examples up on the slide. So uh, I marked the location of these people's center of mass with the end of a yellow arrow. And the arrow points to where gravity pulls the center of mass to the floor. Now I also marked the edges of their limits of stability with these little red lines. On the left, she's stepping out to the side so you can see her feet are really wide apart. This gives her a wide base of support. So if she holds still in this position, she's less likely to fall. The man on the right, He's got his feet in line, so that makes his base of support uh, much more narrow and smaller. And so he'll be more unsteady trying to hold this position. The real important thing to remember here is that what you're doing or how you're standing can affect how easy it is to balance in any given moment. Next, we have this graphic here. This demonstrates a nice way of breaking down the components of keeping your balance. It'll help, uh, so this was actually taken from uh, an article where they, had, they use this kind of framework to develop a new type of balance test that we'll use. Um, so it'll help us to understand what sort of balance problems can develop over time by going through these components one by one. So first, I'd like to discuss biomechanical constraints and limits of stability, these top two components. So the first term basically refers to how the body's structure 
including your joints, your tendons, and your muscles can affect your balance. Uh, so we know that posture, stiffness, and rigidity are common with Parkinson's disease. Uh, rigidity is even considered one of the hallmark symptoms of Parkinson's. So this picture here is from one of the first ever scientific descriptions of Parkinson's disease. If you remember that yellow line from before, so if we add that in here, you can see where this man's center of mass would be. And the red lines mark his limits of stability. What I wanted to show here is how this leaning forward can pull his center of mass forward. So you can imagine he's a little bit more likely to trip forwards if he, if he kind of loses his balance at all. Next, we have the concept called anticipatory postural adjustments. This is another way of saying kind of how we prepare for a certain motion. Um, it refers to the body's tiny motions and muscle activations prior to a movement. So an example that might help is shown here. This picture is taken from a study where they measured how people shift their weight before taking a step forward. The scientists had people with Parkinson's disease step forward with one foot while standing on a device that measured where their feet pushed into the ground. And the results are shown here. As you can see, the participants sort of shifted their weight back and over to the side before balancing over the right foot and stepping forward with the left. We have these unique anticipatory postural adjustments before performing most uh, all of our different body motions. Uh, but some of the most widely studied by scientists have been stepping and reaching tasks. Research shows us that in many ways, people with Parkinson's disease uh, can have their anticipatory postural adjustments affected. Broadly speaking, research shows us that Parkinson's disease can make these adjustments smaller or make them take a little longer to perform and reduce the overall force that the muscles push into the ground with. Uh, the patterns of muscle activation prior to movement may also be poorly organized. So kind of what does this all mean? So you can kind of imagine if you have these smaller anticipatory postural adjustments and you don't really shift your weight enough to the right, you might have a lot of trouble standing on just your right foot as you try to lift your left. Uh, so that's just kind of a more concrete example of what we're talking about here. Next, we have postural responses. And these are another common problem that can come up with balance. It refers to all the um, reactions that your body has to take if you start to lose your balance. For small motions, you can mostly correct these by using your ankle muscles to pull your body back to center. For larger shifts, you may have to sway from your trunk and your hip. And if you start to trip really hard or very suddenly, you may have to take a step quickly or reach for a wall to steady yourself. Think about standing on a bus. If the bus driver is kind of gentle and they gradually press the gas pedal, when the bus starts, you'll feel a little sway. You might lean back for a moment and your toes might lift off the floor but then your ankle muscles will pull you back to upright. If the bus accelerates really quickly, you may sway quickly with your whole upper body to stabilize yourself. But if the bus has to slam on the brakes while you're moving, you may, have, you may start to fall forward and have to step to catch yourself. Think back to your neurologist appointments over the past year. At some point, they probably gave you a quick pull on your shoulders to test your balance. So specifically, this is to test your stepping response in the backward direction. This is such a common test because Parkinson's disease can cause small, slow, or inefficient stepping responses. 
I have a little demonstration I found on YouTube here. Uh, so that's just one example. Next up, we have sensory orientation. And this refers to the process of our bodies collecting balance information from our sensory systems. Primarily, we use our vision, our inner ear, uh, and that tells your brain about the position and movement of your head, and proprioception, which is the sensation provided um, by our joints that tells us what position your joints are in. Once this information is gathered from your body, it's sent to your brain and your nervous system needs to process the information and decide what it all means. In other words, if your brain feels your ankles quickly flex, it decides, to, it decides that this means you might be falling forward and you need to pull yourself back. Think about this picture that I have here. So as you walk over the cobblestone, your ankle joints are telling your brain about this uneven surface that you're on and the incline that you're climbing. Your vision is watching the lid areas to help you orient to the world around you. And if you were to step into one of those dark alleyways, your inner ear would be giving you a constant sense of gravity as you walk into that dark area so that you still know which end is up. One problem that can come up here that's not specific to Parkinson's is that a loss of sensation can make sensory orientation more difficult. One of the most common examples that I could give you is a condition called peripheral neuropathy, uh, and that can cause numbness in the feet which could include a loss of proprioception at the ankle if it's severe enough. Then the brain is simply just operating with less information about how you're moving or that you may be starting to fall backwards and that could cause delayed balance reactions. Uh, with healthy aging, people tend to rely more and more on vision for their balance. And that can lead to problems maintaining your balance when your vision may be compromised. The easiest example I could give you for this would be at night trying to walk across your bedroom without the lights on. Another common example could be if you're walking into a dark restaurant on a bright sunny day. There are those few moments when you step through the door where your eyes have not adjusted to the change in light and your vision is compromised. If you have trouble balancing without your vision, you may become quite unsteady in those few moments. Uh, now, many of these situations you'll notice aren't specific to Parkinson's disease. Uh, we do have some evidence though that people with Parkinson's disease do have a little bit more trouble balancing when their sensory input is compromised with some uh, systematic laboratory testing. And the last component on our framework here is stability and gait. Parkinson's has many known effects on relaxed walking. For example, it may cause slower speed or shorter shuffling steps, among other gait problems. In addition to thinking about how well someone walks, we also need to know how well they can maintain a stable walking in more real life or practical conditions. Uh, so if you're walking around your house or outside, this can include things like obstacle negotiation or getting over a curb. It can involve walking through crowds. It could involve walking in areas that you're not familiar with and you need to navigate through. It can also include your dog suddenly running after a squirrel when you're holding her leash. A key point here is that we rarely would walk in a wide open, perfectly flat area with no interruptions or distractions. So we've now gone through all of the different aspects on the diagram that I had originally brought out. I wanted to point out a few things here that are sort of separate from this framework um, but contribute to balance and are a little bit more specific to Parkinson's disease. So the first, people with Parkinson's disease use increased 
concentration or, or mental focus on their movements to perform that, that motion as well as they want to and to adapt to the dynamic conditions while they're walking or moving around. Uh, while this definitely helps you move at your best, it can mean that you might have more trouble maintaining your balance if you're distracted or trying to do two things at once. Um, Non-motor symptoms of Parkinson disease, which can include things like cognitive impairments, it can include depression, or some people have trouble um, with maintaining regular blood pressure. These are things that can cause um, unsteadiness or, or falls. And then we have freezing of gait, which is another symptom that some people can have. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this term, but um, this, for, for those who might not be, this is a temporary sensation that your feet may feel glued to the floor. And this can occur commonly when you're trying to take your first step or just start walking, when you're turning around, or when you're walking through a doorway, just for a few examples. Excuse me. Got a little ahead of myself. Um, so unfortunately, people with freezing don't always notice that their feet have gotten stuck. And so their feet aren't stepping forward, but they may be continuing to try to move their upper body forward. Um, this can meet, lead to a, a difficult mismatch um, if your feet are stuck to the ground and it can be really unsafe. So it's very important to be very careful around freezing of gait. So just some key takeaways that I'd like everybody to remember from today. Uh, the first is I hope everyone's got an appreciation that balance is probably a little more complicated than you might have expected at first. And there are a few different ways that Parkinson's disease can affect uh, someone's balance. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but no two people with Parkinson's are exactly alike. So these problems can be present to varying degrees in individuals. Um, but knowing what types of problems you have can help uh, your, your neurologist and your physical therapist know how to best help you. And you knowing what problems you might have can also help you decide if there's maybe a safer way you need to try and do something or, or it can really help you be aware that these are situations you might get unsteady. Um, so I hope thinking about balance like this might help someone um, prevent a fall by just raising that level of awareness. Up here, I wanted to leave the contact information for the APDA exercise helpline. So we have our phone number and our email address, which is rehab at bu.edu. Um, I know we'll have a Q&A section coming up here, but if you have any questions that are really specific to your, your um, specific situation, uh, we wanted you to know that this is a resource that's available to you. Um, you're welcome to get in touch with us at any point in time and we can help you um, find someone local who can, can help treat you or we can answer any questions that you might have. Over on the left is the uh, cover for Be Active and Beyond. And this is a free publication that the APDA has that is an exercise guidebook for you. Um, so if you haven't downloaded that already, that's also free and available to anyone to download. And the link is right there in the, the, um, the slide. Before we open it up to questions, I just wanted to point out, um, so we're on a monthly schedule now, and I wanted to show you the dates we have coming up. So on August 12th, uh, my colleague, Teresa Baker, will be giving a presentation about assessing balance with a physical therapist. On September 16th, Tammy DeAngelis will be giving a presentation about evidence-based treatment to improve balance. And we certainly hope to see you all there. Um, at this point, I wanted to see if I could have uh, Teresa join me, and um, I think we have a few questions from, from the audience. Is that right, Teresa? That's right, Tim. Thank you so much for a great, great talk. 
Um, we've had some questions that have come in ahead of time, and of course, we'd be so interested in anyone's questions now that they've heard the presentation. You can reach us in the chat or the Q&A feature that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but Tim, I did want to start with a, a question that has come to us. Um, this person is writing, how does foot pain impact balance? Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I am really glad that uh, somebody mentioned that because that's something I wasn't sure if it was going to fit into the, the, the slide itself. So um, I, I want to answer a little more broadly about pain in general. Um, so we actually do know that pain can have a negative impact on balance. Um, pain is fairly common with Parkinson disease. Um, and, and it's also common with just the, you know, run of the mill musculoskeletal problems we can all have. So, you know, a lot of people will have arthritis and Parkinson's at the same time, as an example. Uh, pain can really interfere with your muscles working as well as they're supposed to. So it can really make your muscles not work at the right timing, or it can make you not push as far as hard as you meant to. So if you're starting to fall to the side and pain is impairing your muscle activation to straighten back up, that can definitely have an effect. Um, I don't know that we know like the exact um, neurological mechanism or physiological way that works, but we do see that um, that pain can have a negative impact on some of those motions. So it's some, another thing to be really aware of. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Tim, this is a, another question that's come to us and it's related to Parkinson's medications and balance. Specifically, the person was saying, do Parkinson's medications help balance? That's another great question. So, um, we know that the, the Parkinson's medications will really help with a lot of your symptoms. So, you know, that'll help with your tremor and your slow movements and your stiffness. So in some ways, you know, if you were starting to trip forward and you needed to take a big step to catch yourself, it might be a little bit easier to take that big step um, on medications versus off medication. Um, but we do see that, you know, people who have trouble with their balance still have trouble with their balance when they're on medication. So um, the, the medication doesn't perfectly get rid of those balance problems. If you're noticing balance trouble, one of the best things that you can do is, is maintain a safe exercise program. And um, if, if you're having a lot of trouble with this, I, I think the main recommendation should be meeting with a physical therapist who can give you some individualized recommendations. They can really take a look at your situation and tell you a nice place to get started and, and some strategies for keeping active and improving your balance and staying safe. Absolutely. We have a, a lot of people writing to us in the Q&A section here. And, um, so I'll just kind of give some groupings to some of the questions that have come through. Um, a couple questions related to the ben and you touched on this a little, the benefits of exercise and positive effects on balance. Um, and maybe I'll just say in general, the question related to what general benefits of exercise related to balance? Yeah, yeah. So it can help in a lot of ways. And and I think a lot of it will come down to sort of what specific parts of the balance system are you having the most trouble with? Um, but we know with practice, you know, you can, you can get better at those little anticipatory adjustments. So like if you're having trouble standing on one leg, but if you practice it enough, you will probably be able to make some pretty nice improvements with that. Um, we've also seen sometimes people can actually improve. They can get a little bit better with the stepping responses. And if your leg strength is a big problem and that's making you unsteady, absolutely everyone can get a little bit stronger with exercise. So, um, so practice with some of these challenging activities can definitely be a big help for you. Um, so it depends a little bit on what specific types of problems you're having, but um, we can improve a lot of these different issues with exercise. Absolutely. And I know that's something we want to get to in towards our September presentation. Right, right. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I know I felt a little bad because I, I know that's coming down in, in a couple of months here, but uh, Tammy is going to be um, putting together a great presentation about a little more detail about the, the real evidence behind what we can do for you with exercise. So there's definitely more to come. Yes, yes. Um, Tim, some of the other questions that are coming through are uh, relating um, kind of other conditions, how they may or may not relate to balance. So there's a question here related to um, sort of losing balance out of the blue and neurologist point of view that this could be related to blood pressure. So I'm just curious your thoughts on blood pressure and how that may or may not relate to balance. Yeah, yeah, because I know I mentioned that earlier in the presentation, but I, I didn't really go into too much detail. Um, but, but basically, when your blood pressure is unstable, if you stand up from a chair really quickly, um, your blood pressure is, is supposed, your heart's supposed to work a little bit harder to regulate your blood pressure after that happens. And if you stand up and, and that doesn't happen, what will happen is your blood pressure may drop a little bit. And if it drops suddenly enough and it doesn't recover, uh, that can lead to lightheadedness um, or it can even lead to um, fainting spells. And in those cases, uh, that, that oftentimes results in a fall. Um, so it's really important to be very careful if you're noticing some dizziness when you're standing. Um, it's really important to have that looked at by your doctor. Yeah, and I think there was another question related to how dizziness fits in with balance, and I think you, you covered that uh, so well. Um, Tim, another kind of style question, and this is related a little bit more to someone that is at um, kind of a wheelchair level mobility and recognizing that maybe some of what you covered today in the presentation may, may not be um, so appropriate or relevant for someone who's at that um, kind of a, a wheelchair level of moving around. But just some questions about other things that we could do to help or um, maybe even other recommendations. Right, right. So I would definitely say, you know, many people who, who use a wheelchair primarily for, for most of their mobility, you know, there, there are times they might need to still have balance, like, you know, when they're transferring from their wheelchair into bed or um, into a shower chair to take a shower. So uh, the balance is still important to everyone, right? Because it, it's something you, you have to make sure you've got balance. I mean, even sitting here, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of standing on my chair, my back isn't right up against the chair. So my muscles are holding me up still. I, I, everybody needs balance. And I think this comes down to um, exercise is, is really important for everyone. And um, there are definitely ways of, of modifying any exercise program so that we can find something that's really comfortable and helpful for you. Um, so I just encourage, if, if you don't know where to start, you could um, maybe consider calling the helpline and we could find a, a local therapist who could help you get started with an exercise program. Uh, I think that that might be a good first step. Absolutely. And some of the questions that have come in are um, particular people situations with someone who has had Parkinson's for a four, four or five years and unfortunately had a stroke and is working on his own recovery uh, and then questioning about different exercises. And again, we'd love to talk to everyone on an individual basis. And our helpline is here for people. Our uh, email, as you already said, Tim, rehab at bu.edu, uh, where we could give these kind of individual recommendations. Um, yeah, Tim, yeah, another, okay. another question coming in related to, I'm curious what you think, uh, devices that can help your balance. What sort of devices? Were, uh, it, this is kind of a general question about any devices that could help your balance. And hmm. I, yeah, I haven't, I'm, I've not necessarily come across that myself. Um, I think we'd probably advocate even more strongly an exercise program tailored to someone's individual balance needs. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, that definitely could happen. I know um, some some people might be asking about like walking devices, uh, like a, like you know walking sticks or a cane or or a walker, and I think that's something that a therapist might be able to help you um, figure out what will work best for you. Um, 
But just like you said, Teresa, I think, you know, one thing I know we'll get to a little bit more in a couple months is that exercise really is the best medicine for this. If we can keep you active and, and really teach your muscles to help um, kind of catch you when you start to fall or anticipate what you need to do to pick your foot up and get up a stair, um, the best thing we can do for that is, is repetition and practice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I hope I answered um, your question. Sorry if I am missing something. And Tim, I know there's there's a lot of um, questions that are still coming in, uh, and everyone is really can tell it's so interested in this information. Um, maybe we'll just take this kind of last one. And any questions that we didn't get to, again, we just welcome people to contact us through our exercise helpline. But this is a question related to footwear. The question is, oh, yeah. any footwear recommendations uh, to improve balance? This is a great question. I get this all the time. So I, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. The hard part is that there isn't really one across the board shoe that works best for everyone. Um, you know, like I, I had my, um, uh, the, the, the person who asked earlier about foot pain. So if you need a supportive shoe to reduce your pain, getting a supportive shoe might help with your balance a little bit. Um, on the other hand, sometimes they're really tall and thick and, and just a little bit harder to balance on top of. Um, so for some people actually like a little bit of a um, less large heel might help a little bit. So it really is something that I, I try to look at people on a one by one basis to try to come up with something. Unfortunately, there's not like that one best shoe to wear. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Tim, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, in general, I just want to say to everyone, if you enjoyed today's session, we hope you might consider supporting APDA with the donation. Uh, with your help, APDA can deliver more programs and services like this one, which are needed now more than ever during these times. Um, you can go to the website, www.apdaparkinson.org slash donate to show your support. Um, and again, as Tim already said, we, we're coming to you again monthly with these webinars. So we'll see you again in August and we'd love to see you again in September. So Tim, I think we probably can wrap things up for today. Absolutely, Teresa, thank you so much. And um, thank you to everybody for logging in. I really hope this was helpful and uh, definitely looking forward to getting to all the questions that we didn't get to next month. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, take care.